All right, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Ware. I'm president and owner of Resurgence Brewing Company out in Buffalo. We've been open about four years now, and um, we are uh, in the process of growing and opening a new brewery and moving some production out uh, into the world. So uh, it's an exciting time for us over at Resurgence, and I'm happy to be here, and, and thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, so let's dig in. First things first, uh, we're going to be talking about beer and everything that goes with beer. So I would recommend if you have a pint of beer anywhere around you, you crack one. Um, you can't really talk about beer with a beer, so I'm actually going to crack one myself right now. And I would recommend that you do every brewer in the world a favor and pour that into a nice clean beer glass. Um, you know, people work really hard to make this delicious beer, and the best way to, to enjoy it is actually enjoy it. Uh, the way it's meant to be in a pint glass, you can get the nose, the smell, the taste, and everything else that goes along with beer. So cheers, let's have a, a nice little meeting here. We are not joining Jeff, unfortunately, but uh, it, it looks great from here. <laughs> well, I'll enjoy it myself. You, uh, yes. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, so what do I want to get as a takeaway for, for everybody today? Uh, really, overall, beer is a, uh, has changed a lot over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and so I'm, wondering, I'm hoping to get everybody as a takeaway uh, at the end of this. Is, just, is this some, uh, an, an opportunity for you guys to be able to speak to what's going on in beer and navigate the current world of beer? Uh, as you can see from this picture I put up here, uh, this is just a small beer store. Uh, you know, choices are overwhelming. There's a lot of new breweries popping up. Uh, it's an increasingly complex, mar complex market, uh, and there's a lot of different beer out there to choose from. So hopefully this will give you a little bit of an idea of where beer comes from and what's out there. So overall, we're going to do uh, how uh, the beer market evolved to where we are today. So we're going to do a bit of history on beer uh, to understand where we are right now. You kind of have to go back in time to see how beer evolved through the ages, uh, especially in, in, in America. Uh, understand the basics of craft brewing process. So just talk a little bit, a uh, brief overview, overview on how we actually make the beer and that process. Styles and types of beer. So we'll talk about ales versus lagers and the, and the styles that fall underneath those two basic beer uh, types, and then a process to taste beer and evaluate beer for yourself. So uh, when we're making beer, uh, we have an evaluation process, and when we're tasting other people's beer, uh, we have a set process of how we do that so that we can really evaluate the full beer, and we're going to help you guys be able to do that at home so you can evaluate beer for yourself. Uh, there's a lot of beer out there, but not all beer is made um, to the same level. Uh, there's good beer, and there is plenty of bad beer out there, so having a way to evaluate it is, is a nice option. Let's dive in. Uh, so, beer history. Uh, I'm going to condense about 10,000 years of history into <laughs> like five minutes here, so bear with me if you have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, but really, uh, it starts about 10,000 years ago or so. Uh, Egypt gets credit for the earliest brews. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of like Ninkazi brewing. Ninkazi was the beer goddess of Egypt. Uh, and they really kind of figured it out, but it got everybody else, all civilizations, that, civilizations across the world, really figured out uh, beer. And it was beer and bread that, that kind of came at the same time. Uh, they were probably trying to soften the seeds, so they put them in water. And by uh, putting them in water, they started to you know, germinate, the malting process started, and fermentation occurred. Uh, but the question becomes, did beer lead to bread, or did bread lead to beer? Uh, and really, nobody knows the answer to that. Um, and these really early beers that they're drinking, you can see in the picture here, they're drinking it through a straw. Uh, these were really ugly, porridge-like creatures. So it was, it was kind of beer and kind of bread at the same time. Uh, but it was nutritious and it made you feel good. I mean, it, it really was uh, the subst substance uh, and food. So, uh, you know, this is what people were using as nourishment. Uh, so it wasn't just, uh, you know, people cheersing to a pint. This is really uh, what they were using to, to survive. Um, and it made them feel good. Uh, so, you know, that's where there was a gift from the gods because they enjoyed it, but they also got, you know, a little buzz from it as well. And uh, so they're like, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, so uh, beer kind of follows early civilization all over the world. Uh, you know, at the, um, every continent figured this out one way or another. It was just different grains and things that they were doing. Uh, cultures uh, all through the South, and, and then it kind of travels through trade routes around the world, uh, you know, it gets into Greece or, and, and the Greek culture. They prefer wine. They don't really like it. But as the Roman Empire expands, it gets up into what is now modern uh, England and everything like that, and they, found, they already figured it out and they were doing it themselves up there just with different ingredients. Uh, so it really is something that uh, has been with us uh, for a long time. It could be argued, uh, honestly, that beer started civilization. Uh, you, know, they're, uh, you know, people were nomadic, and then 
uh, they figured out this beer bread combination. They realized they could plant barley in the ground, and now they don't have to be constantly worried about moving around to survive. They can stay in one place, and once they can stay in one place, they can actually domesticate animals. And if they can domesticate animals, uh, they can start to actually live without moving, and that leads to government and you know, having the time to actually think about public stuff and, and, uh, and building a civilization. Uh, so it's kind of uh, really uh, been with, you know, early civilization and, and all right up to where we are today. Uh, so fast forward a lot, uh, and we get into, like, Middle Ages. And, uh, and during the Middle Ages, uh, you know, you've got feudal systems going on. It's the Dark Ages. It's a really ugly place to be living. A lot of disease. Um, people are really scared, superstitious, a lot of death and illness going on. And uh, so everybody really turns to the church during this time, and, and the church becomes the center of everyone's life. If you ever see pictures from that time, it's always one you know, giant cathedral and then all these little houses around it. Uh, and the church really takes over you know, the stronghold on beer during this time. Uh, so um, they use beer really to maintain and grow power. Uh, really, if you drink water, you die. If you drink beer, you live. Uh, and they didn't really know the reasons behind this. It was because they were pasteurizing the beer when they were boiling it, of course. Uh, but they didn't know that at the time, so everybody would go to church to get their beer. Uh, so monks at the time were making three different types of beer, and it's really a first run, second run, and a third run, just like if you're making coffee. You know, the first run is going to be the strongest, the second run is going to be a little less strong, and then the third one is going to be a really watered-down version. Uh, these were called uh, you know, special beer, special occasion beer uh, they would use, which would be your big, higher alcohol beer, your religious day beer, which would be your medium beer, and then your small beer, which is your third run, which was a, a low ABV, but everyday drinking beer, so probably about 2%. Uh, but that's what people drank all the time, and that's what they were going to church to get. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was really ale over water was the big thing. It was a healthier thing. The church pushed this. And uh, even during the, the plague, I mean, it really became a situation where uh, it was saving people. You know, they were drinking ale, and they would live instead of drinking the water where they would die. So they kind of hold the fort throughout the whole Middle Ages, um, you know, through the plague and, and then into the, the Renaissance. So it's really the church that, um, and especially during the later years, they, they open up the brewing world. They really refine brewing processes and keep the whole tradition of, of brewing going. Uh, after that, you kind of get to this area where, you know, capitalism, the Renaissance hits, capitalism comes in, people start traveling around. And if you're traveling around, you need a place to stay. So you see the emergence of uh, inns and taverns that start to pop up. And, hosting travel, uh, travelers, and these become really uh, centers of communication. So, you know, people go to the tavern, they have nothing else to do. There's not, you know, real housewives or whatever show on that they can come and entertain themselves at night. Uh, so they're going there to hear about what's happening on the other side of the mountain and what's going on on the other side of the country and things like that. Uh, so they become entertainment and news centers. Uh, and since people are meeting there, they start making beer at all these taverns. You know, they're, they're not, there's no uh, place to buy it, so you're making it at each individual local tavern. The taverns, too, get too big, it's too popular, so they can't keep up with demand, hence the, uh, the emergence of commercial brewing, if you will. Um, <laughs> there's a fun story with this, actually. So the church hates this so much that, uh, and, and back in the day, it was alewives that uh, did all the brewing. So it was all women that were doing the brewing. And so, you know, if you picture uh, somebody in a tavern making beer, they'd be brewing it in a big cauldron and stirring the beer and then they'd have, of course, um, you know, like a cat around because there's grain that's going to be everywhere. And then there's a broom to clean up. And so they really uh, start to villainize this process because it's taking away from their stronghold and their grasp on the people. And that's, so that's where the like, witches come from. And that's actually where uh, all of that bred with the church trying to say, this is bad, this is bad. Don't do that. Come back to the church and get your beer. Uh, so that's a kind of just a fun little uh, story from that time. Uh, and it actually ha comes back in America, and that happens in America as well. And, uh, and a little bit later down the road here. So anyway, uh, getting back to it. So we have commercialization of beer, uh, and this is really where it's sometime in the 14th century-ish, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, where you see hops uh, that are introduced to beer. Hops are a natural preservative. So now that you have commercialization, people need to push the beer a little further. Uh, they need something that's going to preserve that beer. Uh, and it also drastically improves the flavor of beer by adding bittering components before they're using all sorts of stuff. Uh, but it's, uh, it's really when you start to see what we think of as beer kind of come, come together. Uh, at the same time, you, you see uh, lager yeast uh, in the 14th century, uh, which is a cooler uh, version of fermentation. So uh, really the Germans get really into lager, and they, they develop a taste for these, these light, crisp beers. And it was most likely that they just, uh, you know, they put some beer in. It was too cold to ferment, and uh, they found out a couple months later it did ferment into this different kind of beer. And like, wow, this is different. Why is it? It's 
lager yeast, and uh, they really didn't understand it at the time. Um, you, get, you see the 1516 uh purity order, which is a German purity order that comes in, and it pretty much says you can only use barley, water, yeast, and hops and beer, uh, and that's why you still see to this day German beers are light cream, pilsners, and lagers, and then you go to Belgium, there's big fruity, crazy beers. It all comes from the 1516 uh, law, which was really the first time it was, you know, the farmers got together and lobbied and said, we're barley farmers, you shouldn't have anything else in the beer. And they said, okay. And, uh, and so you still have that tra tradition uh, today. And then you go over to Belgium, they have these crazy big, you know, doubles and triples and throw anything, you know, you can into these beers. Uh, it's really interesting how that kind of uh, shook, out, shook out, but it'll come to uh, show a difference between those lagers and, and pilsners in our, our drinking world today, down once we get into the American area, uh, era. So from there, uh, you get to the Industrial Revolution, modern, uh, kind of the modernization of the brewing era starts, and uh, that's when you start to see breweries that really start to look like the beginnings of what brewing looks like in America and in Europe today. An important note through all of this is that people still have no idea how fermentation works. So they just know that if they take a piece of the batch from before and put it in the next batch, that it's going to ferment and it's going to be great and, and it's going to happen, but uh, they have no idea that yeast exists or anything like that. That actually doesn't even happen until 1860s in America. Uh, Louis Pasteur and pasteurization, and he realizes that it's yeast and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, I mean, if you think about it, that's not something like 150 years ago. So they had no idea what was happening here. Uh, it was just kind of an awesome thing that happened. Uh, so that kind of gets you caught up on the European side. Now if we flip to the American side uh, and the, uh, the American history. Uh, it's all intertwined. Uh, so in the 1600s, uh, people are drinking ales, and they're flavored with hops from England, and then eventually they start growing them in America. And uh, actually, the area uh, we're kind of in, so uh, upstate New York, really the Albany area, becomes the, it's kind of the, the cash crop here is hops. And so that lasts really all the way up through the golden, golden age of brewing in, in the United States. Uh, and then the, uh, there's a plague that goes through, and there's a fungus that goes through and kills off the hops. And then prohibition really put like the last you know, nail in the coffin on the hop market up here. Now it's all out west. Um, but similar to Europe, uh, taverns pop up and people are traveling news. They want to hear about it. They're drinking in these taverns. Uh, people are still afraid of water. They don't realize that boiling the beer is what's keeping them, better, uh, um, keeping them from getting sick. But it's really, it's, you know, the beer has that whole stigma of being healthy. It's nutritious. It's, you know, think those those Guinness commercials, right? My goodness, my Guinness, like, you know, drink Guinness, it's, it's kind of that mentality. Um, and brewing's becoming really popular. Uh, not so much in the South, it was too hot to, to brew in the South, but all of your northern cities, so your Boston, your Philly, Philly was like the epicenter of beer. Um, even like, you know, Cincinnati, Buffalo, all these cities are getting a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of brewing going on. Um, and, you know, these taverns are becoming places of uh, political discussion over beers. So, you know, you can really uh, say the American Revolution was born out of taverns. I don't know if you guys have ever gone to uh, Boston to do the Freedom Trail, but fun fact, the Freedom Trail is awesome and amazing pub crawl because it's all the pubs that were the important places where people were deciding on all this stuff. So if you ever want to, you know, increase the fun level of the Freedom Trail, uh, you know, <laughs> give me a call and I'll, I'll show you around. I'm going back. <laughs> <laughs> I never looked at it that way. <laughs> um, so... Where are we here? Okay, so we're in the 1800s now, and, uh, uh, and really in the mid, uh, early 1800s, you see huge immigration coming from Europe, and the Germans that came over, they brought their, their lager yeast with them, and they brought their process of how to make beer, um, and because Americans um, are not like Europeans where they, they drink, you know, responsibly, Americans at the time, they're just drinking, they want to get drunk, they are looking for things they can throw down their gullet quickly, and what can you drink the easiest? Uh, light German pilsners. So German pilsners grow crazy in popularity uh, into the to the late 1800s, and you really start to see uh, the golden age of brewing in, in the United States. Uh, you get the advent of refrigeration, rail lines, steam. Uh, so breweries start to get huge, and this is where you have the emergence of you know like Pabst, Budweiser, um, Miller. They're all being formed here amongst hundreds and hundreds of other breweries. Um, so you get up to probably about uh, 16, 17. 100 breweries at this time, uh, and then uh, they're all... From, from, they were German immigrants and, and European immigrants who came over. That's what they had done there. They came back. Yep, so they all came here, and they started making their same recipes. Americans fell in love with them, so you start to see um, ale, which was what everybody was drinking, kind of fall down wayside, and everybody's making these German lagers now. Um, and uh, actually, it's, it's a fun story on that. So they're all, jugging, they're all trying to be the, the number one brand. 
And so uh, at the time, they have these big state fairs, like, you know, and they had, you know, really big uh, Pan Am expedition in Buffalo, and they would build mock breweries. And um, so uh, Pabst actually builds this big brewery, and they, they hire people to do a, like, a taste panel, pretty much. And then they say, yeah, Pabst is the best beer in America. And they, on the display, you know, the big thing, they hang a giant blue ribbon. Uh, so that's where Pabst Blue Ribbon <laughs> comes from. And, you know, Adolphus Bush and Budweiser, not to be, you know, outdone, they do their own competition, and they, they claim that their beer is the best, and they are, in fact, king of beers. Uh, so that's where the king of beers comes from. That's where, like, this is all juggernauting at that time and uh, back and forth. It's, it's, it's really fun, and this is a really fun time to learn about American history mm -hmm. in the beer world because it was really just a, a crazy time. And Buffalo alone had, like, 35 to 40 breweries in it at this time. Uh, so it was, you know, everybody had their, their local breweries, and there was, you know, tide houses with them, and beer gardens. Brewery, it, was, it was just a fun time for beer. Uh, so that all comes to a screaming, screeching halt once Prohibition hits in 1920. 1920, 20, 1920 to 1933, it's Prohibition. Uh, and brewers really didn't think of this was going to be a big deal for them because the thought was still there that beer was healthy for you. This was really something that was more geared towards spirits. You know, people that are drinking a bottle of vodka, things like that on the temperance movement. And uh, so they don't think it's going to be, so they're kind of taken aback when they say, oh, no, you can't make beer either. Uh, so what they start doing is they start making um, like near beer stuff. So they can make like really low alcohol beer, home brewing kits, and, and things like that to survive prohibition. So they would say, listen, we can't make beer, but here is barley, here is uh, your yeast packets. If you add the water, but don't do that and add yeast, or else you will end up with an illegal fermented substance. Yeah. And uh, so that's what they're selling, and people are making beer at home. Prohibition was a huge failure. Um, you know, if anything, it just really enhanced the spirits industry because it was hard to it was hard to hide beer. It was a lot easier to hide, you know, uh, spirits that could be mixed with mixed drinks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this is also where the emergence of the uh, cocktail culture comes from. It uh, wasn't a really big culture before that. I mean, it was there, but it blows up now because people are trying to dilute this, you know bathtub gin that they're drinking has been tastes great with all sorts of different flavoring and things like that. So anyways, Prohibition ends. Uh, it kills off about half of the breweries that are out there. Um, and then uh, it's, you know, kind of a, a double whammy right after that you get the Great Depression. And that pretty much puts all the rest of the breweries out. So from the 16, 1700 you have, you're down to probably about 100 to 150 after the Great Depression. Uh, then you have World War II. Uh, and what's left of, of these breweries are these big, you know, the Budweiser ones, the guys making these big lagers. Uh, you have World War II, and then, you know, during World War II, they want everybody to be um, you know, sending the grain towards the war effort. So now you see a lot of adjuncts coming in and, uh, you know, corn, rice, so that's watering the flavor down even more. Then everybody comes back from the war, and uh, people are looking for, um, you know, really big brands. This is when big brands get, you know, 50s, 40s, 50s. Mm -hmm. Big brands are huge. Uh, so now these breweries are trying to make beer that's even more mass appealable. Flavor keeps going down, flavor keeps going down, and that keeps going all the way until you get into the 70s which were like the worst time in the United States for beer. Um, it is, uh, you know, that's where light beer uh, was created in the early 70s. And um, uh, you're down, yeah, yeah. you're down, yeah, it was great. It was, yeah. <laughs> like we're in a really good time to be drinking beer. In the 70s were a really bad time to be drinking beer. Uh, you're under 50 breweries in the whole United States in the 1970s. Uh, but it's kind of the, uh, the, the, the light was at the end of the tunnel. You know, in the, in the late 70s, people start traveling more. They're going to Europe more. You have soldiers going to Vietnam and stopping in Europe on the time. They're coming back and saying, how come I can't get any of these flavorful beers? And, uh, and that starts to, to, to slowly roll into the craft beer uh, revolution. So in you know, 1978, uh, President Carter signed the bill making homebrew uh, legal again. It was actually illegal to make homebrew. Um, and that kind of kicks off the, the, the new way of doing things. And homebrewing is really the, the gateway into the new craft beer movement. Uh, so, um, in 1965, I mean, this is like the one guy you got to know, Fritz Maytag, he buys Anchor Steam, uh, and it doesn't go well for like 10 years. Like, he's just trying to figure this out. It is the same Maytag guy from, you know, Maytag uh, Appliances, and um, he's just trying to figure this out forever, and he starts to figure it out towards the late 70s, but he puts a ton of money into figuring this out and, and trying to figure the processes out. And then you have a New Albion that comes in 76, uh, Ken Grossman in Sierra Nevada comes in 78, and then you got Sam Adams and other guys coming in the early 80s. And these guys are just home brewers that are trying to figure out how to make beer out of, there's no, like, if they wanted to get a permit for a brewery, they didn't even exist. And, you know, if you wanted to get a fermentation tank, they don't exist. Like, you know, like, the only things that are there are enormous Budweiser stuff, like nothing on a really small scale. So they really are home brewers that are figuring this out together and talking to each other, and they figure something out, they tell somebody else, and it's really communal 
uh, um, you know, grouping that is still really evident in today's brewing scene and culture, uh, everybody helping each other out and figuring out how to do this and make better beer. Uh, the first Great American Beer Festival uh, started by Charlie Papazon was in uh, Boulder. That was in 1982. Um, the GABF, if nobody's banned or they don't know what it is, it's the biggest beer festival in the United States. There's over 2,500 breweries that go to it now. Um, it started with 22 breweries and 32 beers or 35 beers, something like that. Um, but that really signifies the beginning of all of this, and that's how small it started. Um, then you see the, the 90s have like the micro brew era, uh, where you saw a lot of breweries gain in popularity, and then it, it, got, it kind of crashed in the late 90s into the early 2000s. That's where you have, um, so you got a lot of these guys trying to figure it out, and then people start going, oh, wow, we can make money at this. And so you got a lot of people that aren't interested in making the beer, they're just interested in owning breweries and making cash come in, quality goes down, market stinks because there's a lot of bad beer in the market. Uh, so a lot of breweries close, and then you kind of have a slow wave of starting to grow again in the early, mid-2000s. And really since then, it's just been gangbusters. So uh, for like the last 10 years or so, um, it's really been just all up, double-digit growth, you know, huge expansion. Uh, so I said, you know, in the 70s, we were down to about 50 breweries. Uh, we just surpassed 7,000 breweries in the United States right now. Uh, and you can see um, it's a huge market right now. So overall beer is, is falling, uh, and that's your, you know, your big guys, your Budweiser's and, and your, uh, um, your Coors, Miller, everything like that. Uh, but craft is growing. Uh, it's starting to slow, but it's still growing. Uh, but if you, the big thing to take away from this slide is you see that 12.7 share. Uh, that, that's a huge number, and we continually we want to see that grow and grow and grow uh, because we're taking uh, share away from the big guys. And you see that's only 12.7%. There's still a lot of share out there for craft brewers to grow. So people say, you know, is the bubble there? Or, you know, is it craft as big as we can get? I think there's a lot of saturation out there right now. Uh, but, you know, what if that number got to 25%? I mean, that's a, that's a lot of beer. So uh, somebody's got to make all that beer. So that's kind of where we got to today. Um, I'm going to skip the slide in there. Anyway, so that's just uh, talking. Really, the other slide was just talking a little bit about um, how many breweries are there? I think it might be a little bit down in the presentation. But anyway, this is a good time to start talking about, so the difference between macro and micro. So the Craft Brewers Association says it's an uh, American brewer that's small, independent, traditional, uh, small being less than 6 million barrels. That goes up every time Sam Adams gets bigger. Uh, independent says uh, less than 25% 25 owned uh, or controlled by you know, a bigger brewery or some other interest. And uh, uh, traditional, they have to be uh, not, pretty much not making flavor malt beverages. So you know, not making four loco. Things like that. Um, we have a, Jeff, we have a question in here. A lot of craft breweries are being acquired by the big guys. Are those counted in the 12%? They are, they are not. So actually, we'll go to the next slide. And uh, confusion, acquisition, and confu uh, or consolidation, confusion, and acquisition. Uh, so yeah, that is happening. So once you're, that's the 25% um, wholly owned or more. So once you're owned by one of the big guys, you're no longer considered a craft brewer. Uh, so the Brewers Association put out this craft Brewers certification. So this is on all of our packaging now uh, as of, I think, a couple months ago. Um, I don't even know if the cans I brought here today have it because uh, it's relatively new, but it's to, it's to combat the confusion that's in the market because uh, that's exactly what the big guys are going to do. So they can't beat craft brewing at, their, at that game, so they're going to buy into it. Uh, so you're seeing um, you know, breweries like Blue Point, Goose Island, Elijah, uh, they're all getting bought by Budweiser, and then they're pulling some flavoring out of these things. The beer does change for sure. Um, I'm sure somebody's going to, you know, be at my door trying to beat me to, to, uh, for saying that. But uh, there is quality differences, 100%. Uh, they still make good beer. A lot of them are making really good beer, uh, but they're, they're, not a local, they're not a local craft brewery. They are owned by a mega major super company because uh, you're seeing even consolidation of the big guys. So, you know, uh, Budweiser used to be a huge company. Then it was acquired by InBev, which is the biggest beer company in the world. So now they're a super, super, you know, conglomerate. Uh, Miller combined with Coors, and then Miller combined with Miller Coors Molson. Uh, so you're seeing the big guys are getting bigger, and they're starting to buy these smaller brands uh, to look like they're a local, nice mm -hmm. craft brand, when in fact they're not. So they do not uh, count in that. Um, and then you're seeing equity groups that are actually starting to merge and buying up uh, uh, beers. So like locally, we have NAB, which is Jenny, and uh, who else do they have? Uh, Pyramid and you know, the guys up in Vermont. I'm going to forget their names right now. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, Craft Revolution is, is uh, uh, Victory and Southern Tier. So you're seeing these other equity groups that also grown. Uh, and once they're owned from private equity or anything, they're also not considered a craft brand anymore. Okay. Hope that answers that question. Yeah, and do the, when you're buying in the supermarket, 
are you able to tell? Is there, is there labeling in the supermarket? Yeah, there should be on the cans now. Uh, I don't have them on our new cans, but this actual white uh, independent, certified independent, okay. you should be seeing that on cans and on, on your craft packaging. Okay. And uh, they just launched this initiative maybe six, eight months ago. So I think you're going to start to see that coming out right now. All of our new packaging has that exact thing right on the cans and on the, uh, the external package. Great. Right. As was talking earlier, you know, 7,000 breweries, um, and, and kind of going to that saturation point, if you look all the way over to the right side of the uh, screen, you'll see that the microbreweries and brew pubs account for almost 30 percent, that 19.3 and 10.3. Um, and so you're seeing a huge amount of opening, but a lot of those breweries are really, really small, less than 1,000 barrels. Uh, so, you know, yes, the numbers are getting really big, but a lot of them are really almost like coffee shops that are opening. And so they're self-sufficient. Um, you know, they make enough beer for that to serve on premise, but they're not really big volume drivers. They're not going to the grocery store. Uh, so it, it's really changing, you know, the, the original format of the, how breweries went to market. So a little bit about Resurgence Brewing Company, and uh, so I'll stick my commercial in here. Uh, we're a, a beer garden brewery, downtown Buffalo. Uh, we have a tap room right next to the brewery. It's all open air. We're all about the experience of, uh, of, of, of brewing and, and being part of it. I threw a lot of pictures in here so you guys could see. Uh, pictures can sometimes say a little bit better than I can. Uh, why Resurgence? Uh, you know, uh, we talked about it a little bit before. You know, 150 years ago, there were 35 breweries in Buffalo, and that brewing community and that brewing scene is really coming back. And uh, that's really exciting for us, and we wanted to be part of it. And I thought Resurgence really spoke to that. But it even speaks to uh, the broader picture in Buffalo of what's changing there. Uh, the city itself is, is rebounding and growing, and there's been, really been a strong resurgence in Buffalo. Uh, what we're all about, our whole uh, mantra over Resurgence, is, is about you know, teaching, engaging, having our customers be part of the experience. Our whole tagline is experience great beer. So uh, it, uh, it's got to be great beer and a great beer experience as well. You know, I, a lot of time, uh, beer kind of brings people together, and you're with your buddies hanging out, and you remember having a great time. And beer's got to be a part of that, but you remember the whole experience. And so we want to really craft that experience for our customers. Uh, this is a nice picture of the tap room when we first opened. Um, it looks relatively the same, but it got communal space, sharing. You can see the brewery right in the back room there. Uh, this is just shameless self-promotion. Uh, so this is the tap room with, uh, you know, at, at night, people enjoying it. We do different events like yoga, things like that. Oh, you, um, do, you do beer and yoga? Beer and yoga, yes. Yogis are also beeries, as we, we found. <laughs> uh, so this is our outside beer garden. Uh, so it's, a, it's an old sunken, uh, it's a foundation of building. It's actually the area down there. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a fun uh, kind of experience. Actually, there's a good, time, a good story about where beer gardens come from. Uh, actually, I'll get into it later when we talk about lagers. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we have, it's just a nice, entertaining place, family-friendly. Uh, that we want to have. So we also do distribution, which this is a, is there a way to play the video on this? Um, no? Yeah. Okay, so it's a commercial for Resurgence. Uh, it just shows all of our cans and all of our different products that we're starting to push out as we start to uh, grow and expand. Uh, we're putting out 16 ounce cans, 12 ounce cans, and so you'll start seeing us in the market. We're actually hitting up the market, uh, the Rochester market will be opening in spring of 2019. Uh, so you'll start to see our stuff in Wegmans and uh, all the beer stores around town. Uh, same thing on draft distribution. You'll start to see us bars and restaurants around town. We just can't make enough beer to get out of Buffalo right now, so that's the only reason we don't. It's just uh, we can't make enough liquid to do it. So that's enough about resurgence. Um, what I want to get in here with the brewing side of things is uh, ingredients, brewing process, fermentation, uh, which is the most important part, and then finishing and packaging, which is uh, my least favorite part of the entire brewery uh, because it's a pain in the butt. So. Uh, to start there, we will just pop into uh, malt. Uh, malt is the backbone, really, of any beer. Um, so, you know, what is malt? So, pretty much malt is a, you take barley and then you malt it. So, I, this is a really cool slide I thought kind of gives an idea. And most of these slides I stole straight from the internet, guys. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm really busy, so <laughs> I just been sitting at home putting this together. Uh, so, if you Google or you're curious about any of this stuff, there is so much information on the internet right now about brewing, the history of beer, uh, all the processes. Uh, it's really easy to get yourself educated. Um, but barley, pretty much the idea is you steep barley in water. Um, that, that barley kernel gets soft. It starts to germinate a little bit. Uh, so it, it's, it's, availabling, uh, it's making available the starches that we're going to want in the brewing process. Uh, once they get to the point they wanted to in the process, uh, they dry it, so they kiln it. So it's really just kilns, partially germinated uh, barley is what malt, malt is. And that's the first step in our brewing process. You can see the pictures down here. Uh, you have pale malt, roasted barley, 
special beef. So there's you know, all these different kind of malts out there, just like coffee beans, you can roast them darker and all this kind of stuff. Uh, most any beer that's made is about 90 to 92% just pale malt. Uh, so even if you have this big, robust stout, it's probably only about 8% um, of these specialty malts and everything like that. Uh, that's why dark beer is not always a heavy beer. It could be a very light beer that just happens to have a darker roasted bean, uh, you know, not bean, but barley in there, uh, and vice versa. You can have a really big, cloying, mouthfeel beer that's very light in appearance. Um, so again, uh, barley is the backbone of beer. Uh, it's the preferred uh, grain for brewing uh, because of processes we'll get into later. It really sets a good, a good bed so you can, you can pull those sugars out of it. Uh, provides sugar for fermentation, provides the body of the beer, the color, the sweetness, the uh, the foam and uh, head retention. So really there's a lot that barley brings to the table. It's just not really the sexy side of the ingredients. Hops are. So uh, everybody talks about hops. Hops are the greatest thing in the world. Uh, we love hops because we love our IPAs. We certainly use a ton of them at Resurgence. Uh, but really what we're trying to get out of hops here, um, and I'll, I'll show you on the next slide exactly what they look like, but uh, the bottom thing there is the, um, you know, your lupulin gland. So those oils and those resins are what we're trying to get out of the, the hops. So that's where your preservative action is going to be. Um, that's where your bittering units are going to come from. That's where all that wonderful floral aroma that you're getting grapefruit and, you know, uh, melon or whatever hops you're using, it's all coming from that lupulin gland. So that's what we're after uh, in these hop, uh, hop cones. So these are what hops look like. So in the bottom right, you can see that's uh, them growing. They grow about 20 feet a year. Uh, so they are, uh, they are pretty much like a crazy weed. It'll grow quickly. Uh, they grow up what's called binds, and then uh, they're cut down, shook out, and you're going to end up with this guy has in his hands, hop cones, and then they're processed down into um, the uh, pellets that you see. And we use them in pellet form. You can brew with full, whole cone. It's messy, uh, and you're, we're really trying to get the, the uh, oils out of it. So the uh, easiest way for us to do that is extract it through the, uh, the, the pellets there. Uh, so, again, uh, hops are going to give you the bitterness, your IBUs, uh, aroma, balance, and, and they're a natural preservative. Water is another ingredient that is wildly, uh, um, you know, not popular to talk about in brewing, but you need good water to make good beer. It's the most, it's mostly water, you know, so um, what you really need to know for 101 is we take things out of the water and we put things back into the water. Uh, so we can get really, and this could be a whole class uh, just on water. We take out, you know, the undesirables, uh, chlorine is the really big one, uh, you know, that we have in, in our municipality uh, as far as water goes. And then we'll add some things back in like chloride and, and, and uh, things like that to soften the water if we want to, or get the right pH or anything that we're looking for. Uh, yeast, I love this picture I found of yeast, because uh, it's, it's really a good idea of what, what's going on there. They're one-cell microorganisms, uh, and they, they pretty much eat sugar, and their byproduct is carbon dioxide and alcohol. Uh, so uh, these are the real workhorses of the brewery. They do all the fun stuff. They make beer fun. If without it, it'd be sweet, gross uh, sugar water. Uh, they do all the hard work here. There's two types of yeast, uh, ale yeast and lager yeast. Ale yeast is top fermenting, lager yeast is bottom fermenting, which we'll get into a little bit more here. And then lastly, there's you know, adjuncts. Adjuncts is anything that's outside of that Ryan Heinz we were talking about. Uh, so if you're gonna, you know, in the world of brewing we live in now, I mean, you can put anything but you know, the kitchen sink into a beer, and we certainly do. Uh, so you, know, you can use corn, rice, oats, whatever you can think there, any kind of other grains, uh, and especially ingredients anywhere from fruits, you know, spices, uh, you know, flavored sugars, uh, for instance, you know, we, uh, we are just now making our sponge candy stout, which is made with the actual inside of sponge candy, uh, which is really just a, uh, a, spun, uh, a sponge sugar. So uh, you can really get anything, put any kind of weird kind of fun stuff you want to in beer, which is kind of what makes beer fun, and, uh, and you can have these cool off weird flavors. Uh, and we certainly do at the brewery. Okay, so how do you actually make it? So you got the barley uh, starting at the top. Uh, we'll just run through this real quickly. Uh, so you start with your, your barley, and you're going to crack the barley in half uh, so that the, we can get to the starches uh, that, are, uh, that are what we're going to turn into sugar. So you're going to crack it through a mill, and then you're going to drop it into what's called your mash tun. Your mash tun really acts like a, a big tea bag. So it's going to be hot water and then all of this grain that you've dumped in it, and it's going to, uh, it's going to sit in there, and then uh, there's enzyme, enzymic, I don't know. It's take, the enzymes are breaking down the starches into sugar, uh, and that sugar is what we want to get or the yeast to eat later. So then we're going to push this over to our louder ton. Our louder ton is pretty much a big filter. So it's got a, a false bottom on the bottom of the bed. And then we, uh, we put all that grain, water, slurry on top of it, and we start pulling from the bottom. And so it sits onto that bed, and it makes a natural filter. And then we're going to sprinkle water all through that, and it's going to, so it's going to start pulling all the sugar through this grain bed, 
So we get a really a nice clean sugar water, which is called wort. Uh, so now that we have this wort, uh, we're going we're gonna to put it into our kettle and we're going to boil it for about an hour and there's all sorts of scientific stuff that's happening, you know, caramelization of the, the, the sugars and all sorts of different stuff that's going on in here. Uh, this, it could be another topic. Uh, but really uh, what you need to know is during the boil, this is where we add hops or this is where we're going to add cinnamon or any kind of other thing that we're putting into the beer. So uh, if we're making a, um, like our vanilla pumpkin, this might be where we add some pumpkin, this might be where we, uh, vanilla or cinnamon or nutmeg, things like that. Uh, if we want to put hops since they we're making an IPA and we want to make it bitter, we're going to put it in the beginning of the boil and then it's going to isomerize throughout the boil to give us those bittering units that we want to. So if you want a big bitter beer, this is where that happens. Uh, if you want to have a big floral beer without that bitterness or uh, you just want that big floral flavor, it's going to go into the end of the boil so you're not getting any of that changing to bittering units, you're just keeping that floral nice aroma uh, at the back side of it. So we boil you anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half depending on the, the uh, beer we're making. And now we gotta get it ready for fermentation. So we're gonna take that wort and we're gonna cool it through a heat exchanger and bring it down to wherever that yeast likes to live. Loggers like to live in the mid 50s, um, L yeast likes to live in the mid 60s, low 70s. And uh, we're gonna put it into a fermenter and let these little yeast get, go to town. Uh, and so they'll go to town uh, anywhere from like three to five uh, days, maybe longer depending on what we're doing. And then we're gonna put them to, move it to a conditioning tank where it's gonna sit and mature over time. And then we will carve it up uh, either filter it or not filter it, and then put it into some sort of package. So um, that's the 30-second elevator, elevator I know, uh, pitch on brewing, uh, but feel free to follow up with questions. Yeah, Jeff, we have one question. So going back to your history conversation, when you said brewing was not happening in the American South in the earlier days, is that an environmental temperature and climate factor that now maybe isn't as big a deal because of modern facility. Yeah, so it was too hot. Uh, so you can't brew when it's hot out. Um, actually, maybe this might be a good time to talk about uh, lagering and where beer grinds come from and everything. So uh, the beer of the day was really, um, so again, yeast like to live, even ale the yeast like to live at 70, 75, so it's 95 degrees out, and you have active fermentation going on, that tank's gonna go up to 110, 120. You're gonna have really phenolic, weird flavoring beer, um, and then it's gonna spoil because you have nowhere to store it. So. Uh, you know, beer is an active living ingredient and, it, you know, it'd be like having a, uh, a head of, of lettuce and then letting it sit out. It's going to go bad pretty quickly. So you, you physically couldn't do any kind of brewing in the South until refrigeration started. So uh, lagers, um, so back in Europe, they figured out they like these clean lagers in Germany and, you know, they, they have to ferment in like 50, 55 degrees. So they actually tunnel out uh, underneath, you know, by the breweries and put uh, lagering tunnels underneath. So they have all these tanks that would be in these, these tunnels underground. And they needed to keep those temperatures really cold. So what they did is they, above the tunnels, they would actually cover it with gravel because gravel would uh, absorb the heat uh, or push the heat off, I should say. And then they built uh, canopies of trees over them, so they planted trees. And so you had these gravel areas with tree canopies over it to keep the ground underneath cool, and people started hanging out in them, and that's where beer gardens kind of come from. Oh, uh, so, um, and if you look at like, you know, Oktoberfest celebrations, uh, again, with it being all based around heat, uh, the, last, the last beer that they made of the year was always in March. They're called Marzen beers. So a lot of your Oktoberfests are Marzen beers. And they put them in these tunnels, and then they would pull from these tunnels all summer long. And then, um, you know, it's usually late September or so, they would have a huge party signifying it's the last batch of beer in the tanks downstairs, which means it's finally brewing season again. We can actually start <laughs> making beer again. And it was that important to them and uh, that, they, that you know, they would have huge celebrations to say, it's beer season. And uh, we still do it now, even though we don't have a lager, we have other ways around it. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to just kind of see where all this kind of stuff comes from. And one last question, so clarification, the more sugar, the higher the alcohol content, is that correct? That's it. So, yep, so if you want to find out what your, your ABV is, you have your starting sugar level, and then you do fermentation and you take your secondary you know, your, your, uh, your secondary sugar level, that displacement is going to be your ABV. Uh, so yeah, so the, the more food you give them to start, the more they'll eat. And we can, t we can stop them. Like, so we want a really sweet beer. We can stop fermentation and leave some of that residual sugar in the beer. But uh, yeah, that's exactly how you're getting your alcohol level in the beer. Okay. Yep. Great. Uh, so talking about fermentation, uh, ales versus lagers. Uh, uh, so ales are top fermenting. So the, the yeast crowds and sits at the top of the tank. Lager sits at the bottom of the tank. And that's why with ales you're getting really big fruity flavors and big, um, you know, uh, high ABVs sometimes in them. And, and they're just they're really fruity and big flavors. 
and uh, you get like raisin fig, all these kind of different things. And lagers are um, clear, crisp, uh, really easy drinking beers because they ferment over a long time at the bottom at a much colder temperature. Uh, so the, the yeast are going crazy and with the ales and lagers are taking their time and that beer is clearing out during that time. Uh, lager, or, uh, ales are usually hazy and there's still a lot of yeast in suspension. It happens very quickly. Uh, so it's warm fermentation versus calm fermentation. Uh, but those are the two main styles of beer that everything is based off of. So really, uh, when I say yeast is you know, underappreciated, uh, your beer is really based on what yeast you're using. Uh, so, do we have a question? No. Nope. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, lager means to store. So again, we're you know, storing those beers in the tunnels. Uh, that's where lager comes from. It's bottom fermenting. It ferments uh, cold. Uh, it takes much longer to do because it's happening much, uh, much cooler. Uh, you get crisp, light, clean beers out of it, and it's relatively a modern age beer. Uh, ales have been around forever. This is the stuff that the Egyptians were eating. It was, mm -hmm. It's put yeast in there and see what happens, and that's what we're going to drink. And uh, um, we do it between 60 and 75, roughly. It's warmer. This fermentation happens in a couple days. It's a vigorous fermentation, and you're going to get fruity esters or fruity flavors and yeast esters. Uh, and then again, this has been around forever. Packaging. I didn't put much on here because uh, packaging is kind of a necessity. We've got to get the beer out there. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a pain in the butt. Um, you, every time we add package, there's a, an option for oxidation, there's an option for spoilage, there's an option for uh, machinery breakdowns and delays. Uh, big thing to pull away from here is that, uh, you know, look at all these percentages. The biggest one is packaging. So it costs us more to put beer into package than anything else in the process. And uh, it drives me insane. And then, of course, uh, uh, distributors and uh, retailers take enormous margins, but we can have a six pack if we're going to talk about that one. <laughs> All right, so understanding what you are actually putting uh, in your, your body. Uh, so uh, we'll deep, uh, dig a little deeper into ale and lager in this one, and then we can go into uh, taste and smell, prop, properly uh, tasting beer, and we'll kind of push through this stuff pretty quickly. Draft quality, shelf stability, freshness, uh, it's all important to what you're going to actually buy at the end of the day. So again, uh, there's ales and there's lagers and there's kind of hybrids. So your ales are going to be uh, your porters, your stouts, your pale ales, your IPAs. Uh, they're all top fermenting beer. Your, so, excuse me, your lagers are going to be your clean, crisp beers that are out there. So if you're out there and you, somebody hands you a beer and you can see through it and it's really light tasting, it is a lager for sure. Uh, if it is a big, dark, uh, hazy beer, it is a ale, unless it is a really poorly made lager. Um, again, not all beers are made, uh, made the same. And then you kind of have these, these hybrid sales, like an Oktoberfest, right? Uh, it's clean, it's crisp, you should be able to see through it, but it's going to have a dark malt color to it. Uh, so it's going to have a little bit more flavor than a traditional light lager, but it's still a lager. It's got to have that crisp, clean finish. So there's a little bit more, and again, you can find this stuff online if you want to dig a little bit more into it. Um, but it gives you the idea of there's ales and there's lagers, there's two types. And then you've got, you, know, you have your pale ales, your IPAs, um, your Belgians, which are going to be really fruity and, and, and big, uh, big flavors and things like that. Sours are a kind of a new and upcoming trend in the United States. Uh, they're going to be really, really tart. Uh, and have a, a, a you know, really cloying tartness. I don't know the other way to describe it. Uh, I have some here. It's easier to taste it than describe it. Uh, your <laughs> we'll let you know. Yeah, your wheat ears, your browns, your porters, <laughs> and your stouts. Uh, and then they're all their, their family tree that goes off of there. And then with your lagers, you can have dark lagers. You can have box, which is just, a, again, a, a dark style of lager. And then you have your pale lagers, which are all your mass domestic type beers and things like that. I hate to blow through these, but... Uh, I want to uh, get through the presentation here. So um, a little bit about, and if you want to figure out you know, what you're tasting, you kind of know how you, you have to know how you taste. Uh, so uh, you taste every flavor all over your tongue, but there's certain parts of the tongue that taste things uh, a little bit better. So if you're having an IPA and you want to taste that bitterness, you're going to get that bitterness in the back of your, your tongue, in the back of your mouth. Uh, but if you're having a, a sour beer, you're going to get that up front on the sides. And then sweetness is really tasted up front. Like if you have a piece of chocolate, you're going to taste that right up on the front. And of course, the rest of your mouth is going to pick up on it. Uh, and then umami is uh, like savory, uh, like it's a savory flavor, uh, and you get that all over your tongue. So just a kind of a quick point that you do taste things in different parts. So as you're drinking that beer, you can pay attention to be like, wow, that is really sour. It's really killing the sides of my, my tongue. Uh, but there is no uh, full flavor without smell. Uh, it really is smell is an integral part of, of tasting. Uh, a great way to try this for yourself is take something that's really big flavored, uh, big flavored beer, uh, maybe like a, a local fruit beer or something like that. And if you plug your nose, um, you're just not going to pick up any of the fruit. It's going to taste like, you know, it's like when we were a kid and we plugged our nose when we had the medicine. Uh, yeah, that's because you can't taste it. And uh, so uh, smell is equally as important uh, as actually taste. 
when you're doing beer, that's why I say when you have a pint, put it in a glass so you can actually smell that aroma that the brewers work so hard on. Uh, if you're leaving it in the can, you're missing half of the experience. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, a little bit, I mean, uh, there's a nose uh, picks up the odor, and then it sends signals to the brain. Those converge with your tongue, and that's how you get a flavor. So it's really a, a, a tandem uh, cycle there. So how do we taste beer? So there is an actual process to doing that. It's a appearance, aroma, taste, mouthfeel, finish. So I actually took this slide. Uh, this is what we use internally when we're doing taste panel. Uh, so first thing first, we're going to do uh, appearance. So um, right now I'm drinking a Oktoberfest stylish beer. So I'm going to look, is it clean? Can I see through it? Is it the right color? Is it uh, the nice clarity to it? Is there a good viscous head? Things like that. Uh, then we're going to go to aroma. Uh, you know, so without even tasting the beer, I'm going to smell it. Does it you know, have the roasty nose that I want, the biscuit flavors, things like that. Uh, and then we'll go from there to the flavor. Uh, and as you can see, they're all rated for different scores. So the appearance isn't as, as important as the aroma and the flavor because really those are the two big things that we're working on. We want to be able to smell it good, we want it to taste good, uh, but there are other things that we want to uh, consider as well. So we're going to do the flavors, we're going to drink it. Is, is it tasting appropriate? Are there off flavors in it? Uh, or is there inappropriate flavors that aren't to style? And then uh, we're going to do mouthfeel. Mouthfeel is going to be, you know, is it thin? Is it thick? Is it coating the tongue? Is it just going down and then dissipates and it's gone? Uh, so if you're having a nice lager, you're going to want it. It's going to be a session beer. You want it to be, go away quickly. But if you're having a big stout, you want that to coat your whole mouth and feel that sugar all around uh, and then have it kind of linger for a while. So the mouthfeel of beer is very, very important. And then overall, how do you like it? You know, is, 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 is it a good beer? Is it a bad beer? Um, and, and do we want to change anything with it? Uh, and then also we, we talk a little bit about finish too a lot. Uh, how does it taste, you know, three, four seconds after you swallow it? It's not like wine, you swallow beer uh, because you have to have that finish and that aftertaste because uh, it does change. So nobody's spitting the beer out. If you're out sampling with us, you are drinking the beer. Jeff, quick, quick question for you. Um, thoughts on the commercial craft brewer organizations like BJCP training home brewers to become judges. Do you benefit and do you actually use home brew judges for tasting panels? Uh, we do. So we're a big proponent of it. I mean, beer education is something that we're really into. Uh, so we just did a taste panel last night. It's led by a certified Cicerone. Cicerone is a, uh, like a sommelier to wine. Mm -hmm. A Cicerone is that to beer. And so we have one on staff, and uh, we have several on staff, and uh, they lead our tasting panels, and uh, they actually go out and do panels and uh, teaching in the market. Uh, I think an educated consumer is a good consumer for us. So, and, and, and people are becoming more educated, uh, you know, especially in a, a the craft beer world that's out there now, um, the, the worst thing you can do is, is have somebody uh, pushing beer that's not good uh, or people going out and drinking beer and going, this is great, when it's actually horrible. So uh, we want people to really uh, become educated. There's a lot of resources out there to educate themselves. Uh, we do a lot of blind tasting in the brewery, and we'll actually bring in um, BJCP judges, uh, and, and, and then we want to mix them in. So we have judges, we have uh, novice drinkers, we have brewers, all in these panels, so we're getting everybody's perception and perspective. Uh, but the more educated they can be, the more we can talk to what's going on in the beer. Uh, so we love those organizations, and uh, we host them. We're happy. We host homebrew groups because, uh, you know, it's really about the community and, and, and getting education out there uh, to figure out a little bit more about what exactly we're doing. Does that answer that question? Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. Okay, so um, again, off flavors do present in beer. You know, uh, this is why you have those judging competitions and things, uh, and we want to be careful of them. The big four to <coughs> take away uh, are diacetyl, acetaldehyde, oxidation, and light struck. Oxidation and light struck, um, those come from the market. So, uh, you ever get a skunky beer? That's because it has been hit by light, UV rays. We did a test yesterday, and I took our lager and took a clear growler on a cloudy day and left outside for a half hour, and it was as skunky as can be. Uh, so. Um, you know, beer does change over time. Uh, beer gets old. Uh, it, it gets cardboardy and, uh, you know, so papery. Um, so oxygen and light are the two things that really hurt beer. Um, warming temperatures will also break down beer, especially hoppy beers, quicker. So if you get a hoppy IPA, you want to keep that thing cold all the time straight through because uh, warming it up will kill uh, that aroma and that, uh, that nice juicy flavor that everybody's talking about. And diacetyl, is a, that's a brewing practice one, but it's, it's quite common. That's that butterscotchy taste if you ever have a beer uh, and you're drinking, wow, that's like popcorn butter or butterscotch. That's an off flavor from fermentation, and, and uh, that, that means the brewer uh, kind of messed that beer up. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Uh, so, uh, again, you can learn more about this stuff online, but I know we're running out of time. 
Um, but uh, draft quality, uh, stability, and freshness is something I want to talk about. And this is why local beer has an edge over non-local beer, because uh, beer is, is, is almost always better fresh. Uh, it's, 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 it's a product, it's a living thing, just like if you're going to get vegetables from the grocery store, fresher is better with, with almost all beer. Uh, so, um, you know, they, we put our date codes on everything we do. We want people to see that that beer is young and it's great and it's, it's the way we intended it. It does fall off a cliff over time, especially a lot of, a lot of the small breweries are not, um, are not uh, putting their stuff through any kind of a pasteurization or anything like that. Uh, so these beers do, do not last long on a warm shelf sitting in a store. So uh, cold beer is better beer, fresh beer is better beer, draft quality programs. Not all, like, not all beers are, are critical, not either are bars. So if the bars don't clean their lines, like you wouldn't eat off a dirty plate, why would you drink beer through a dirty draft line? Uh, so you can pick up a lot of those off flavors. It might be a great beer, goes through a gross draft line, and it tastes awful in your hand. It might just be the bar's fault, not the brewer's fault. So, um, you know, not all beers, uh, beer bars are created equally. A lot of them, like we do, put up the last date that we cleaned our lines. We clean them every two weeks, uh, which is a good uh, practice. And then warm shelf works cooler. Beer's always gonna be better in the cooler. Uh, food and beer pairing, I don't really think we have time for it today, uh, but really the gist of this is there's no bad uh, combination. There's, there's better combinations, uh, it, but it really is uh, so subjective. Uh, so, you know, things like an IPA is going to pair really well with spiciness, but the thing to take away at the end of the day with pairing beer is that there, you're going to do two things. You're either going to complement it or contrast it. So, you know, sweet goes with sweet or spicy is going with sweet. You're contrasting those flavors. Uh, either way, you could, it could be an awesome pairing. Uh, I, uh, I would ask you to explore it and uh, you know, experiment on your own, but there really is no bad pairing. Uh, there just can be ones that work a lot better than others. Uh, so uh, ending, um, I want to talk a little bit about you know, resurgence. Uh, we're still very young. I mean, so we're kind of, you know, when we opened, there was only two other breweries in Buffalo. There's 35 now. Um, so we're almost like the vets that uh, were four years old. So. Uh, we're, the industry as a whole is very young. There's a lot of breweries opening up right now. A lot of them are opening on that coffee model house I talked of. So they're just self-sustaining small, um, small breweries. Uh, there's been the evolution of the tap rooms. Tap rooms, you know, didn't exist five years ago. Now everywhere, uh, every brewery has a big tap room. We call these third space. Millennials are really into drinking in third space places, um, which are like not your corner gin mills. So they want to go to see a baseball game. They want to go to a brewery. Uh, they want to go to a uh, you know, pop a beer garden in the park or, uh, you know, roller derby or something, you know, things that are different and they're drinking in those, uh, those places too. So even where people are enjoying beer is really changing and evolving uh, quickly. Uh, we're growing as well. You can see here, uh, there's an old building on this. Uh, that old building is going to be our new tap room. Uh, and then we're building a brand new brewery on the side of it. You can see the bottom picture shows what it'll look like. It's all said and done. Uh, it should take us from a very, very local small brewery to at least a, um, a more regional brewery, so you know, covering Rochester, Syracuse, maybe Ohio, and a bit of Pennsylvania. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, quality and local will always win because uh, you know, if it's local, that means it's probably fresh. But just because it's local doesn't mean it's good. So make sure that that beer is still good. You can do your quality experimentation and uh, enjoy all the beer that's out there. It's a good, it's a good time to be a beer lover. <laughs> that's all I got. Wow. I thought I knew a lot about beer. No. Apparently not. I'm going to so. go lay down in the other room now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was great. Thank you so much.